Welcome and thank you so much to everybody that's joining us today for this webinar. My name is Adele Kroch and I'm from Food Focus and I want to thank the Dairy Standard Agency for sponsoring this webinar. The Dairy Standard Agency um, is a company that is a non-profit company and um, we are receiving a lot of positive feedback from industry that the webinars are adding value to them and it is great being part of it. The webinar will be recorded and the slides will also be available with the recording. Normally we send out um, social media posts to let everybody know that the recording as well as the slides is available and if you go to foodfocus.co.za on the home page there's a button that says resources and if you click on the resource it, it drops down and you will see all the webinars that we've hosted before with the DSA as well as other webinars that we've hosted. The DSA is surely achieving their objective to support and interact with, in, in, with the industry and all of this to promote the improvement of quality of milk and other dairy products in the interest of the consumer. We have a very interesting topic today, and the topic is um, the fear factor in microbiological automated test methods. We are generally reluctant to change from the known to the unknown, especially from things that has been done in a certain way for ages. Why should we change? This is specifically true for all of us when it comes to microbiological test methods. Technolo sure, sorry. Technology, however, has been developed that automate the total bacteria count in raw milk, for example, but due to the unknown, we struggle to always see the value in this. The relation between the traditional ways of doing things and automation can be complex to understand and to interpret in our daily business. This talk today, we will try to uncover the value and how we should use automation to fully benefit from it. So it gives me pleasure now to introduce you to our presenter today that is going to help us to take out the fear. So who Rian Lombard will help us um, today to, and he will present to us this topic. Um, Rian has a BSc degree in microbiology. He has almost 20 years dairy experience and mainly in the analytical environment. He worked for Clover as a microbiologist and a lab manager and he later moved to um, Lacto Lab as a lab manager. And he also worked at Delta Mune as a sales executive. And for the last seven years, he is with Biomurie as a sales and application consultant. So Rian, um, I really would like you now to, um, there you go. Thanks Rian. If you can just remember to unmute and I'm going to make you the presenter now. And we are really looking forward to your presentation. So thank you very much for your time and um, over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry for those that can see me. Um, I just want to quickly say hello and thank you for the opportunity to be with you guys today. I really appreciate it, especially from the Dairy Standard Agency. Um, I've done some little bit of homework and the value that uh, Adele has mentioned. I hope that you guys can have value from what we are discussing today. So uh, uh, I'm going to kick off with uh, the talk. And yes, um, I tried to use uh, a topic just to entice us all in thinking of uh, what are we doing today, what is happening in the world, and uh, where the world is moving to. And I think it's very important that we are aware of things that's happening all around our borders, for example. Um, and to kick that off, I want to give you a little bit of background on what the life that we experience, how we operate normally. And these two pictures or circles nicely tell us what is the, the, the comfort zone. It's all about what do we define as the comfort zone? Normally, it's nice to have it nice and interactive with people telling you what you feel. So I'm going to 
give a few examples of the different zones that we're operating in life. Um, but yeah, the comfort zone is normally where life is easy, it's unchallenged, it's stable. So it's really when you're sitting in front of the TV watching a rugby game, for example. <laughs> um, it's a place where you feel secure, there's not much risk. The negative part of this is that you might move into a sense of, your, you've got a sense of control, but it can lead to boredom. You're safe, you feel safe in this area, but then again, you might stagnate. And so one needs to move out of this comfort zone. And normally to move out of your comfort zone, there is a bit of fear, there's reasons, there's excuses we have to come up with that we don't want to do it. Our confidence might not be great. So if we don't, if we stay in this comfort zone, we will always have a very small circle, for example. We need to have, be challenged in life and that's where we start moving into a learning zone and from learning we can grow. So the idea is there needs to be a trigger normally and you have to have some courage to move from comfort your growth zone but when we are challenged too much we can move into a stress zone where we physically say no i can't do this um, there's no self-confidence um, you're frustrated you find excuses not to do it you decline on things you get anxious so this is all things that you don't want to go into so when you are tested by a Someone telling you, for example, I want you to fly a jet plane now. Immediately you will move from your comfort zone straight into stress zone and it will not happen. So we need to coach ourselves in life how to move from this comfort zone and learn and grow instead of going straight into the stress zone. So that depends on the challenges that's being put forward to you in life. But as a rule, um, as we want to improve on what we're doing in life, we have to move out of this comfort zone. And for me, this is also a very good example then of why we look at different things like type of bacteria count. Well, I've done it for ages like this. Why need we move? But clearly, as we say, if you stay in this comfort zone, you will stagnate and uh, life might move past you and without you knowing there's better things to do or can be improved on. So, um, yes, to put you straight into a bit of a stray zone, <laughs> um, I, I uh, use this in these two documents as my source of the talk today. And uh, it's just to um, make sure we are comparing what's happening outside in the world today to what we are normally used to. But we've moved on, so it's not all gloom. Um, the important thing is to understand that we there is great guidance documents like this bulletin 511 that describes uh, this conversion, this change from total bacteria or CFU into automation. But let me, so actually what I'm trying to say, everything that I'm discussing here will be coming from this, even the graph that I'm showing is sourced from these two documents. Right. So a little bit of background. Um, historically, we all know the standard plate count method or the SPC. This is this beautiful example of a Petri dish with some colonies on it. And there's a Koki pen that's been used to count them. So what we get from the SPC is the colony forming unit. So we are all familiar with that. That's old school. That's maybe 130 years old technology. I don't think we can call it technology anymore, but that's the way it's been done for ages. And in, in a lot of instances, this is still the reference method, or we also call it the anchor method. Today, worldwide, though, mostly flow cytometry is used, where we obtain a total bacteria count. So we'll have to discuss these and we'll show it later on. So it's a little bit different. It's an instrument that does the test for you. So there's optical sensors, there is a flow system, there's lasers, there's electronics, there's pieces. It's far removed from this method, the traditional method. So important to understand and be aware of these methods come from a different angle. So they are not equivalent. But because of the unknown, we want to say, 
see, is there a conversion that we can use to go from this automated method to the traditional method to make sense of it all? And that's the background of this talk today. Right. Um, so hygienic measures of raw milk has been happening for a long time, especially, of course, to grade our milk if the farmer needs payment for raw milk. We need to know certain parameters in that raw milk. And one of the um, biggest pain points is, of course, the total bacteria count, the fat content, the protein content, as well as somatic cell count are used in this payment schemes. But uh, normally, one of the number one priority parameters being analyzed for raw milk payment schemes is the um, total bacteria count and that's then where there's specific incentives and penalties uh, applicable in these uh, results so as you can imagine it is quite important for the milk buyer as well as the supplier of that raw milk to have an accurate reliable source of data where they can because we're talking about huge money and the uh, the time I've spent in Clover, this was always for me very interesting. Uh, a few, a few percentage left or right of the line has a huge economical impact on the business buying the milk, but also the business supplying the milk. So, for both parties, it's, it's critical to have a really reliable so data source and make sure you get proper answers first time every time. Um, so that's, as I say, one of the key components of the quality of your milk. But there's also legislative rules that say, what is the limit of, for example, raw milk in South Africa? What are we allowed to uh, deliver to a processing plant or in the past even to a, a raw milk outlet where raw milk was sold? Of course, the, 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 the rules change a little bit. But yeah, this is the two big reasons why we are testing Total bacteria count in raw milk is for these two parameters. Um, as we said today, industry worldwide has moved over to flow cytometry, um, but the traditional method is still sitting there and we need to try and make sense of this all. Currently in the world, there's only two manufacturers of these flow cytometry instruments. And this little graph here just shows you how the two, it's two from two different sites in the world, one with one supplier and other supplier. And the correlation is actually quite great. It is so the technology is 20, 20 years plus old already. A lot of work has been done, a lot of samples has been tested. So the optimization of the equipment, even between two different suppliers, are really of a high standard. The challenge though is transform this alternative method that we know works really well to what we, to the anchor or the reference method. I'll come back to why we call it the anchor method. It's because of micro. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so quickly on total bacteria count. What is it? What are what is happening? What are options? What can we what what methods can be applied? Traditionally, total bacteria count is the flow cytometry as mentioned, or the standard plate count, or some also refer to it as aerobic plate count. And that's where we get to this anchor method or reference method. Uh, typically plate counts, there are several versions, there are several suppliers of media. There's even guys that try to make it a little bit easier for us with petri film, for example. But it all boils down to these parameters. 30 degrees Celsius, 20, 72 hours, or 35 degrees for two days. Okay, so it's standardized growth medium. Um, as much as you can standardize. As you can imagine, people producing different agars in different conditions in different countries with different raw materials will have different growth abilities of these areas. So there's a lot of um, actually variables in this 
even with the standardized times and temperature, there's still fairly parameters that can have a big influence on the accuracy or the growth ability of that media. The positive thing about these traditional media is, of course, it's very simple and it's low cost. You need to prepare the agar for it and count it two or three days later. So it is really simple, but the precision, the repeatability, reproducibility, and the fact that even it's only one temperature, as you might know, a lot of bacteria has the ability to grow at high and low temperatures out of our normal 30 to 35 degrees. And you might lose like thermophiles or psychotrophs, the organisms that likes cold conditions. So yeah, a little bit background on the total plate count. Fly cytometry, on the other hand, are dependent on the interference components. So there is a special step to get rid of them. These are typically uh, packed protein your somatic cells. So that's the background noise. And there's always a, a, a discriminator, a line where it's cut off, where it does not count the, the noise that the interference components create. Uh, Sample, it's a fluorescent marker that stains the DNA and RNA of an intact cell. The detector measures the light impulse and you get an individual bacteria count. Traditionally, of course, it performs standard plate count by far. It's a standardized method and hence a lot of the people in the world moved over to this test. If, um, and then there's of course a lot of other advantages, speed, it's uh, almost immediately, there's no incubation. So very different from the total plate count methods. Both have its place in the world, but for accuracy, repeatability, and time to result, fly photometry is uh, a step or two above. Right, so we've looked now at the different methods. How can we connect these two together? So clearly, as mentioned, it is different measurements. It is not the same technology. It's not the same principle. And that's why I rather call the plate count method, the traditional method, the anchor method, because it's living organisms in a, in a lot of variables that's possible. So it is critical to be aware of this. And this is what this graph or this picture really nicely show. Uh, where the cube represents the result that the bacteria are interested, but the angles we are attacking from is quite different from the two different methods. So they do meet somewhere in the middle, but they, so there's overlapping areas, but there's also areas of where these methods are producing results that's not that clear or that's different, much different from the other one. And that's when you look at conversions, this makes it very tricky to get to be in that cube 100% with both analysis methods. Hence, calibration is not possible with microbial analysis. And uh, if there's no calibration, then one has to look at possibly a conversion or factor that can be developed to try and cover as much as possible. And uh, here, one of the factors that really interesting is the fact that there's a lot of no factors that influence it but specifically the way bacteria grow in in nature remember uh, bacteria even milk itself milk is a living organism there's a lot of activities fat that moves up and down uh, a lot of components but even the bacteria in milk is very different so the flora the type of flora and even the growth phase um, has a huge influence on the way these two methods can accurately test or enumerate your bacteria. For example, you might sit here with unknown number of bacteria in the traditional colony forming unit. These three bacteria might clump together, those four might clump together, and these two are separate. So when you incubate, you count it, you might end up with three bacteria because those were clumping, specifically organisms like Streptococci, Staphylococcus aureus, 
which are typically milk organisms as well, you'll find them then creating, and that's why we say CFU, colony forming unit. So you don't know how many bacteria grow grew here to, to obtain one visual organism. Close cytometry, on the other hand, has the ability to separate these organisms one by one, and it will physically count nine compared to three. And as you clearly can see, that's that's a big difference. So that can become 300 or 900, for example. Um, and then we say, hey, this, the comparison here, there's, a, there's, there's some big difference and we need to account for that. And that's the idea of the conversion. But yes, there's a lot of things. The milk storage time, as you can imagine, is the samples preserved or not? What does the influence on the preservation have on the, of, of, the in, of the bacteria being intact? Or the bacteria stop growing, and that might have influence on the quality of the of the test itself. Logically, preserv preservation will not be used for the traditional methodology. It's only for the flow cytometry. Even the animal species can have the influence, as you might know. Uh, Jersey milk, for example, the fat content is much higher than in Holsteins, for example. And there you might find different type of organisms growing. The flora makeup might be fairly different and have an in influence on it. Um, high fat, not fat, sorry, it's my fat. <laughs> uh, high fat and protein, uh, seasonal, seasonal variations, a lot of things, even the type of bacteria. Somatic cell count as well might have a big influence on the, the relationship in this correlation that we're trying to establish. So yeah, it is fairly complex. It is, there's a lot of factors that one has to keep in mind or take into consideration when you want to establish this conversion factor. So to go to the conversion, this ISO method that I've mentioned, 21187 or the IDF 196, has a wonderful clear way of doing this. And it's a huge number of data that you have to take in consideration. It's complicated also, um, as you can see from these uh, possibilities of how to do your measurements or your calculations. It's tricky, guys. You really need a high, uh, highly specialized person, some big statistician to make really sense of these numbers. So <clears throat> a lot of effort to establish this conversion. It is not in any every lab's capability of doing this. And as far as I know in South Africa, we have not attempted this. Um, in my past history with Lactolab, we did do a lot of comparisons, but uh, you can do an Excel uh, factor, but as you'll see later on this factor, <laughs> it's very subjective. It can have a huge influence from one sample to the next. Um, so yeah, it's tricky. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It's really involved. Uh, you need to be a specialist doing this conversion. How is it being used today? Okay, so it's important to understand it's quite difficult to standardize um, uh, due to all the factors we've mentioned. It's quite costly to develop and maintain and you need special, special skill people to give it up. But yeah, the cost is immense. They actually in the standard, they refer to at least once a month, you have to add to your database a few hundred samples. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of work, additional work that keeps on going on. And, and of course, the more you add, the better your, your factor conversion will become. But yes, it is, it's, it's costly and it's gonna take some time. And then logically, these equations differ. And I've got an example here for you, where you can clearly see the difference from, um, let's say 100,000, that's the black line, CFU, compared to different equations. And you can move from 260,000 to 650,000 using different equations. So yeah, for me, there's a little bit of a warning sign here. I mean, that's a huge difference, uh, which one is now correct. So 
to move from IBC, individual bacteria count, to colony forming unit, even with the different con European countries that has developed their own factors. That's quite a big difference. In our own experience, we find this one to be quite accurate. It's not that linear always. There is a tendency, the more the bacteria, the higher the IBC count uh, compared to the CFU. So yeah, um, another good example is, for example, the Danish, they have their conversion factor. If you compare that to what other regions in Europe is doing, it, is, it looks like it's normally quite uh, in the middle of all of them. So here's about a factor of four, but it's all relative. You'll see even once again, if you have an IBC of 750,000, that can relate to 100 to 263,000. So that's, that's a quite big difference. Um, so one need to understand this properly. And that's where all the stakeholders in this whole lineup will need to be educated or determine, do we need a conversion factor at all? And that's where I want to move then lastly to, to the what solutions is possible. Um, we can use a lab specific equation, but just as mentioned now, that's going to be tricky because you need very specialized, expensive time, um, a real la lab with a lot of activity outside, adding a lot of value that you will not see really in a uh, rand and cents value. So that's a one option. Or you can have a national or global conversion. But once again, as you see from the previous graph, what will be this? Will this be? Can be can be a quite a wide variety of variants. And then the third option could be to say, we avoid the conversion, we don't use it, we use the IBC. So let's have a look at if we use these different options, what is the influence on, the, on the, our businesses, on the environment that we live in. Um, for, for compliance with most legal limits, of course, your local specific conversion will be, it will be positive for that. If you use no conversion, that might be a problem because it is not legal limits are normally set in CFU. So here you might sit with a problem. How do we compare with legal limits? Except if you can write it in your legal limits, which is not very easy, of course. Um, it is done many years ago and legal documentation tends to stay to the old traditional old school methods. So yes, that's the that's a negative part of not moving over to a conversion, of not using a conversion. Uh, same with the former settlement modules. It will be a very specific conversion factor where everybody has got a buy-in, or even a national conversion might sit much better than with the, using the IBC count straight, logically. For legal disputes, though, then, the, the picture changed quite nicely because now you take out all the variables. There is no conversion factor. There is no discussion who's wrong, who's what. The IBC count is IBC count, as we saw from literature. Uh, the instruments itself, if it's correctly optimized, give you very good results and it's comparable. <clears throat> if you look on improving the tool to to have a better environment of your hygiene on the farm, of course, all three options will not be really influenced because you are still looking at the same thing, you understand? So 10 to 100, that's a, or that's a, or 10, 100 to a 10, that's an improvement. Doesn't matter what scale you are looking. So yeah, there's not influence at all. But the results, once again, from an independent lab, what I'm trying to say here, sorry, yeah. <laughs> uh, how independent is it? Once again, then you lose your independency because you are looking at very specific conversion factor. Simplicity, and the cost of development, there's no cost here. Minimal here, but big time on the value is more, I mean, there's a lot of cost here, but if you have no conversion, you don't have this cost. You don't have to develop anything. You know exactly what's going on. 
because you are using the IBC, the individual bacteria count from the instrument straight, so there's no conversion. The big thing though, and that's where education and where we have to get out of our comfort zone and move into learning and growth is to, who's the stakeholders, identify them correctly and make sure they understand if you want to use the, if you don't want to use a conversion. Otherwise, a conversion might be very easy as a solution when you have, if you only look at this parameter where the stakeholders are involved. And yes, I think that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so Is much, Ryan. <laughs> yes, yeah. It seems like that um, with your presentation, you've done such a good job that um, I have not received uh, a, a lot of questions at all. So um, I think from my side, what I would like to understand is, I mean, this last slide now that you've shown is definitely, um, you know, one that would give a lot of answers um, to the people. But um, from my side, um, what I want to understand is, is, you know, like the, the what is the, the uh, yeah, are there any additional benefits beyond accuracy and effi um, efficiency that organizers, organizations can derive from using automated microbiological test methods? For example, does automation enable better data analysis or integration with other systems? So I think that slide of yours, you, you know, is alluding to, you know, the answer. But is there anything else that you can say that um, that would also assist the audience in making these decisions? Uh, by all means, of course, uh, automation uh, time to result is it's far better. It's 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 almost immediate compared to three to two to three days. So time to result. Then. Um, your accuracy, your repeatability is on a much higher level because you have got almost one, one variant that you're looking at is the instrument and with daily optimization of your instrument controls and control charts that you run the way, if the instrument is used in the correct way, you really have something that is dependable every day, each day. With your traditional micro, you really sit with a lot of variables, the way the mega is made up, the person counting them, the dilution that's being made, how accurate is the dilution. There's a lot of things that has an influence on the traditional micro compared to flow cytometry automation. Um, so automation brings in then that sense of real high value result within a very short time, and almost no hands on time. Eh? So you free up your your personnel to do more important activities, like making sure your instrumentation is calibrated, is running optimal. So you're really adding value on the quality of result you're doing instead of having someone with a co-keeping counting bacteria. You understand that can take many hours and imagine the fatigue, the, the effort that has to go in just to, just to copy results from that little dots you made onto a piece of paper back into some Excel document or whatever. So there's a, and then we talk about traceability. There's not much traceability with traditional micro because uh, there's a lot of steps and a lot of things that happens. With automation, you've got this wonderful graphs that actually show the bacteria, what it's been counted, what is the background, what was the discriminator level. So really a lot of things that one can use to say automation is a really a step up from traditional method. Uh, I hope I answered you there. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think something that you've mentioned there is time is money. So in terms of reducing the time that is spent in, in that itself, there's already a, a big cost saving. I've got a question here from um, Yompi. Thanks Yompi for your question. What is the relevance of the repeatability when you do automation? Okay, uh, good question. The relevance, of course, is you want to uh, make sure 50 is 50, tomorrow it's still 50, and in four weeks' time, 50 is still 50, you follow, and that's where automation has this ability. 
when you um, and reproducibility, whereas the repeatability of course, so 50, repeatability would be more than, I've got 10 samples that all have 50 total bacteria or 50,000, whatever the number you are looking at. And that needs to be accurate. Um, with the traditional methodology, that is something different. Even to, between two different uh, analysts, you can have quite a big um, discrepancy between the repeatability of a test. So yeah, hence the answer from my side is yeah, automation, repeatability is one of the parameters that you also check when you do the, the effectiveness of your instrument or the, 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 you can say the calibration status, the, the optimization of your instrument. Definitely. And um, I must say, um, listening to, to your presentation and that summary that you made with your last slide, um, I really think that, um, you know, that can take the fear factor out of it and um, hopefully get people to change and understand, you know, the benefits from it. Um, Rian, mm -hmm. it does not seem like we have any other questions coming up um, and um, it shows that um, you answered everybody. So <laughs> well done on that. So I just want to say thank you to you, Rian, for your time. And once again, thank you to the Dairy Standard Agency. As I've mentioned at the start, um, this uh, presentation as well as the recording will be available um, and we will make you aware on social media um, of this. And please also have a look out um, on social media and in our newsletters for the Dairy Standard Agency's webinar for next month. We will make sure to make you aware of what the topic is. And yes, after the um, webinar ends, there's a short survey. Please take the time to answer the survey questions. We really look at these answers and um, Jacqueline and Yompi and their team are really looking into ensuring that they answer the needs and make sure that they can get, um, give the feedback to you. And with that, I'm so grateful that um, the um, load shedding and everything here in South Africa played with and um, we managed to go through the webinar without any glitches. And I would like to wish you all a pleasant day until the next time.